So um, I've done this a, a few times over the, the last last number of years. It's usually about an hour. Um, and we do a little short simulation with an, an online game that talks about some of the ideas. I'm going to save the game for after the talk. So you'll be able to find me in one of the rooms in Wilo. So if you just do find users, um, when I get closer to the end, I'll just peek and see which room is empty. So probably scatter plot or, or one of those rooms if you want to come in and try out the game. So um, I will go through it a little more quickly, probably. So if it is a little bit too fast, then just uh, um, we can chat afterwards or put something in the chat that it's going through a little bit, a little bit quicker. So we skip some of this preamble. Um, we we had a, a new neighbor move in next door um, a couple of years ago, um, and I wasn't exactly sure, you know, how to how to how to do this change in our neighborhood. So I thought. Um, you know, th there's got to be a best practice guide. There's got to be a step-by-step -step practice on how to create urgency with that neighbor and how to create some kind of guiding coalition so we could arrange to have a, a, some type of communication plan. Um, and I ended up finding this really interesting process for, you know, how, how, to, how to integrate with a new neighbor. So the first thing that we did is we spent a couple of months trying to identify the need to create this relationship with this neighbor. Um, got a business case done. My wife and I signed off on it. Um, so that, that was pretty good. That process worked pretty well. Um, then we got into our assessment phase and uh, we started just observing them from a distance to see if, if they were ready and, and open for this type of relationship. Um, we identified the relationship recipients uh, and we tried to understand and have empathy for how they would feel through this change. And then once that worked um, pretty well and we thought, okay, you know, we, we've got a way to move forward with this, then uh, we created the plan. So we had some key milestones, we created a communication plan, and then uh, my wife crafted a, a resistance mitigation plan. So just in case the new neighbors were resisting our attempts to be their friends, we wanted to make sure we could overcome that resistance. So when we, when we reported back to, uh, you know, town hall about how this process was working that, you know, we at least had a plan in place. Um, then we went into execute mode. So, so we worked in monthly sprints and we wrote some user stories on how to get this change to go. And we went through that execution phase. Things worked really well. And then uh, we went into our sustain mode. So we, we bought a best practices guide for sustaining relationships and wham, there you go. We're now friends with our new neighbors next door. Um, has anybody had a new boss or had somebody move in next door ever? in your lives. Did you go through something similar like this? Like try to try to assess some kind of plan and overcome their resistance if they didn't want to talk to you? Or what did you do? You could just throw it in the chat. How did you how did you get that change to work? Invited them for cake and coffee. Yeah. I mean, for some reason, beer, even better. Right on, JP. Um, the interesting thing is, you know, why do we lose our minds when it comes to changing our organizations and we forget how to be humans? For some reason, we, we just, we think we've got to follow a, some step-by-step -step process. We get everybody, you know, aware of the change. We build their desire for the change. We train everybody on the change and we steamroller the organization with it. And then when it doesn't work out the way we thought. We just go, ah, well, we did our thing, but all, all those folks resisted. Um, it, it's, it's a lot more simple than we think, but it's definitely not easy, as is evidenced by, has anybody seen the version one state of Agile surveys? Um, this is now their 15th, 15th or 16th that they've been doing. And pretty much since the inception, resistance to change has been number one on the list as far as reasons why uh, companies aren't getting Agile to work. Um, and usually about between 50 and 60% of the respondents give that. But we just, I don't know, there's, there's just something odd about how we forget to be human um, when it comes to that. So uh, short version, um, I was in one of my first large transformations. It was about eight months in. And have you ever reached a point where you just wonder, why isn't any of this working? You know, this Agile stuff is not hard. This is pretty simple stuff. Why, why does, how can people not get it? Um, 
And I remember this was in a building that's the size of a city block here. So just a, a massive um, building. It's New Year's Eve day. And I'm just sitting there in my cube wondering, maybe it's time to go. Like nothing, nothing's working. I have no idea what's going on. So I just sat down and wrote a blog post. And just that sort of started to get me thinking about the whole organizational change aspect of, of, of Agile. Just wondering why. There's got to be something I'm missing. Um, so long story short, over a, over a pile of years, that led to a, a, a bunch of different things. So I remember I did a conference talk on this at the Agile Conference, some the, the big Agile Conference somewhere in the US. And um, Pearson Education said, hey, do you want to write a book about this? Because nobody's really talking about this in that way at the time. People were, but it wasn't as popular as it is today. Like back then, you know, most people were saying it's not a silver bullet, it's not just an IT thing, but that's pretty much what the attitude was towards Agile anyway. There were just a few little small minority pockets talking about um, the org change impact of that. So I did nothing with that book, and then that led to some video lessons. People remember Pearson Live Lessons or Front Row Agile. Um, the uh, Lisa Adkins and I launched the, the first two videos. Um, we went to a studio in Washington and she did our coaching agile teams and I did my agile transformation one to try to think about how could we take some of these ideas and in, in agile and design thinking and lean and lean startup and mash these things together to, to, to bring forth a better way to help organizations change instead of just trying to run it like a project. So um, from 2014 up until we weren't allowed to go outside anymore. I went on uh, on the world's least rock and roll sounding world tour ever, the change management world tour, and visited a whole pile of organizations, did a pile of training and workshops and you know, multinational organizations, smaller startups, medium-sized startups to try to find out why were they getting stuck and how are they getting unstuck. And out of that, these these five universals were were born. So I used to have a great big stack of all this, all these stickies in one spot, and I just stuck them all together and, and came up with these, with these patterns to realize that there was a pattern for how people were getting past some of these questions. So most of the organizations and people, they wanted to figure out how can we get other people to do that? How can I get those people to do this? How can I get those managers to buy in? <clears throat> how can I overcome resistance? Uh, and then more from the kind of traditional change management world where it's very much project, um, project management driven. Uh, how do I apply agile to change? And it turns out that these, these five universals, um, I wanted to call them universals because it's, it's much like a neighbor moves in next door. There's just things as humans we know. Go over and bring some cake and say, hey, I'm Biff, I, I live next door. Once you get unpacked, you know, give me a call or just knock on the door, we'll invite you over for dinner. Everybody knows that, except for socially weird people like me, where, you know, you kind of have to act like a robot sometimes. But we just know that they're universals. It's things that everybody can understand. Doesn't matter what language you speak, doesn't matter what country you're from. We all know that. And the, the first one was when companies were able to, fl to, to flip from urgency and move towards cause and purpose, they were more likely to do something meaningful. So if you're familiar with John Cotter's eight steps, step number one, create urgency. And he warns against false urgency, but that's still one of those things in the change management world that is we have to create urgency for those people to change. And the problem is it's usually biased from the perspective of the leaders or the organization. So it's urgent for us as leaders to increase shareholder value. So you all have to change. So it's usually one-sided, but organizations that can kind of flip that and talk about a, a higher sense of purpose or cause, we're getting unstuck. So example, this organization, they were small, about 100 people, and they expected to double or even triple in size within a year. And they wanted to hire an agile coach because we need to go agile to be able to do that. So I went in and talked to them, ran a Lego series play session. And the model that you see on the screen was basically the structure was at the top of the model, if you can see it, was the company now and all the bits underneath was all the stuff they've changed since inception. And what they realized was they have a very strong sense of resiliency as an organization. Their superpower is being able to reinvent themselves when they need to. So their fear was if we triple in size, we're going to grow this way. We're going to have 40 layers of management. We're never going to be able to get anything done. But if we don't put some structure in place, it's going to be complete chaos. 
how do we balance in the middle? So after that session, I mean, the good news for them is they felt a lot better about where they were going and they had a pretty good idea about what they were going to do. I guess the bad news was they didn't need to hire me. So, you know, that was not good for the wallet, but uh, it was great for them. They realized they had a deeper sense of, of purpose and they were in the healthcare space too. So they were talking a lot about the, the benefits and the welfare of people that they serve. Um, the second one, you know, comms plans is a huge thing in the change world. What is it? You have to communicate at people 21 times or over and over again for them to really grok it or internalize it or understand it. What I found was communication plans meant broadcasting, as in, you know, we're pushing information at people. Um, it's scripted, it's structured in a certain way that doesn't invoke dialogue, but it's more for compliance purposes. And if we can flip things towards, um, meaningful dialogue versus just broadcasting information at people. We have to be willing to do that. We have to be willing to talk about the hard conversations or nothing is going to change. So there's always a fear, generally speaking, from change in communications people that we, if we don't craft the message right, if we don't create the right optics, you know, people will resist and et cetera, et cetera. But that's what we want. We want that reaction so we can have that honest dialogue. Um, this was an organization where um, I was in and out of this place a number of times over, over, over three or four years, kind of just the external uh, foreign element, I guess, if you want to call it that. So we would do these summits. This was a, a multinational financial organization, and we'd have the CEO and CTO on stage kicking things off, a couple hundred people, and we would facilitate a bunch of sessions over two days to sort of close the door on the previous, whatever it was, three months, six months of um, their, their programs for change. And then we'd open up the door for the next ones. So we use this tool called Slido. It's funny because every year we had to use a different tool because we use Slido. And then the IT people were like, well, crap, uh, that's not an authorized thing. So lock it down. I'm like, all right. So we went and used something different the next time around. It's pretty awesome. Um, so the screens are behind the CEO and the CTO on the stage. And this is anonymous real time. So people are asking questions with their phones in real time and they're showing up behind them. It's not being filtered or curated by the comms person. Um, this is a, an example of some of the feedback. So we were asking for feedback every so often and it was public, it was up on the walls for people to see. If people were lost and confused, we wanted to talk about that. So the one year uh, CTO is on stage and the uh, somebody asks a question, um, you keep telling us how we have to change. What are you prepared to change? And like who in their right mind is gonna stand up in the middle of a town hall and say, um, CTO, uh, what are you gonna, nobody. And what comms person is gonna actually seed that question? You know, I've been to enough town halls where it's usually the communication person crafts the messages, hands them to people um, because they want these questions, they want the leaders to be seen answering these questions. And we just totally did the opposite. And that was awesome because he actually answered the question uh, without a bunch of nonsense. He said, well, I'm a naturally competitive person. And I push away more than I should sometimes. So sometimes I just have to learn to kind of relax and sit back and um, let things kind of evolve the way they should evolve. This led to a bunch of things. Their CEO would go on road shows where he would run lean coffees with like 50 people at a time and not talk, just listen to the problems. And he would pull information from people if he felt people were holding back. Um, he, he would stop them and say, I need the real story. I can't help if we don't actually have the right dialogue. And the, the cool thing with the messaging in this entire transformation is their messaging was very much, this is a generational change. Yes, we're running a year long program. We'll be retired before we see the benefit. So it was just so awesome for them to invoke that, that dialogue and really get people talking, put some people off but the majority of people liked it. The next one, and this is obvious, experimentation over uh, executing tasks. Has anybody worked on a change where you spent a year working on the change, the status report was green, but nothing was different? Anybody seen that before? The, uh, the, the first um, company I mentioned where I was sitting in their gigantic office writing a blog post, they've been running transformation programs every year for the last 12 years. So, um, and they always use the exact budget. I mean, that's pretty awesome. They, they hit the ROI, they hit all the targets, but actually it was 
a couple of weeks ago, somebody from that same organization emailed me and said, hey, we're looking to do a transformation. I'm like, surprise, surprise. So the whole idea is that as an external, it's easy to kind of laugh on the outside, how crazy that sounds. But it, it's more about helping companies learn how to experiment in their own contexts. You know, a multinational bank is going to look totally different from a media company. But how can we help them continually evolve? Because there is no start and end state. It's continual evolution. Um, the change world likes to separate project and change management. So, you know, project manager does all this stuff. Change manager does all this. And the two shall not mix and mingle. We need to have clear separate responsibilities between the two of them. So it's almost like the project management stuff ends up taking front in center stage over top of the stuff that actually matters with folks. That's always going to be a reality. You know, somebody's got to pay for the budget of the external consulting companies or depending on how their internal financial structures are. Somebody's got to pay for that. Somebody's got to report on it. So yeah, it's always a reality, but don't let that take away from figuring out how to continually evolve. And this was in an organization, sorry for the horrible picture, but this was in the iPhone three days. So that's probably the best we could do, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, th these guys were in pretty bad shape technical, technical wise. So 16 teams and the 16 teams would frequently collide with each other and break each other's stuff. So all 16 teams have their own branch for anybody on the call who's technical, you know, they would develop for six months on 16 different branches and then just woo, let's dive in the pool and try to get it all to work at the end. Um, that's kind of like building a car out of sticks. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> so the problem was they didn't really have any infrastructure, or anything in place as an early warning sign. So that we put that siren up. And uh, just as a side note, um, uh, throw a yes in the chat if you've done this. Has anybody used Philips Hue bulbs when you were in a physical office to signify events? That's what this was basically for. Build breaks, turn the siren on. So we had to use a radio frequency uh, device to be able to do that. So they use this as a training thing. Siren would go off, they would block the ability to check in, and they would go into um, they would go into the logs they'd find out what happened and they would go back to the team or developer um, as a training opportunity to say hey here's this broke the build here's why next time try this or that or the other or come ask us if you need help they still do this today so this was 15 years ago ish they still do this today to a certain degree it's all, obviously it's a lot more sophisticated than it was back then but that was the experiment because there was so much stuff being broken all the time, they didn't know what to do. Well, let's try it and see what happens. Um, this one's always been my personal favorite response to change over resistance. So I did everything I needed to do, but all y'all resisted and, you know, I don't, not my fault. If people are really up in arms and actively resisting with the, uh, about the change, that's actually a really awesome thing because now we have data. Now we can go have conversations and we can find out why. If it's an apathetic response and nobody cares, then you have nothing to go on. I worked in one uh, financial organization here in Canada and it was the apathetic response. It was just like nothing. No experiments worked. No lean coffees worked. No conversations worked, nothing. There was no information coming back to me to, to find out what was happening. It just, everything was just completely, you know, water off of a duck's back almost idea. So I didn't have any insights to go from. Um, there was this uh, organization where we were, I think there were five of us on the uh, transformation team. And sometimes you just get a feeling that the change is off the rails um, I don't know if that sounds crazy uh, to some people, but throw a yes in the chat if you've ever kind of worked on a change or a transformation and you kind of, you just feel like it's off the rails. Um, so that was very much our feeling. We went into this uh, session with the managers and um, one of my friends, Andrew Annett, uh, wrote this on the flip chart. What are you tolerating? And it was probably the best conversation we had with the managers. Because it just felt like it felt like actually we were the pain in the ass. You know, they're trying to get their day job done, and here comes this irritating agile coach saying, "Write your user stories or whatever. We're going to come in and train you and change your mindset." So we just felt like we were in the way, and we wanted to validate that. 
so this was a great retrospective and it really helped us um, throttle the change to them, pull back a little bit in some areas, redirect our energy somewhere else. But most importantly, it was a great opportunity for them to realize we were there to help and support. Like that was always our stance and our view, but sometimes, you know, I don't know about you folks, but for me, a lot of the times I, I felt like I'm in the way as the change agent, you know, you go into a meeting and you see people go, oh, God, why is the babysitter here? Like, we don't need somebody here at our sprint planning, or we don't need somebody here for this or that or the other. So we wanted to start that dialogue. Um, getting buy-in is another, and this is the last of the five, getting buy-in is also another big thing in the change community. I've had so many questions over the last six, seven years around, how do I get the managers to buy in? And I always ask, but then why are you there? What are you doing? If, if nobody wants this, what are you doing? Just to get them to think, right? Um, so this is usually a pattern of people up here at the top hire us as change people to change those people. So now we have to craft something and we have to sell it downwards. Whereas what we wanna do is we wanna bring the top and the bottom together and have them co-create it. We step aside and facilitate. So we move from change manager to change facilitator. If we do this together, and, and co-creation is such an awesome word. I mean, it's probably one of the most hated words in change by now because it's been around for so long. It, it's not a magic thing. Like we're all going to agree and everything is going to work out fine and everyone's going to love it and blah, 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 blah. No, some people are going to hate it. Some people are going to think it sucks. But we want to be able to still invite people to the party, ask them to dance, let them opt out. Um. So this quick example, um, before I get into the wrap up, this was with an organization, the, the top leaders wanted to go agile as it was. And the top left of the screen was the reasons why from the organization's view, top right was the reasons why and concerns from the management team. And at the bottom was the reasons why and some information from the teams and the people. So we brought all these different perspectives together to figure out, well, what's in it for all of us? So it's not just a case of the people at the top decided and they kind of rolled it downhill to people. So the interesting thing with all this is um, it's not binary. And some people say, see that. I mean, how many of you have seen the manifesto interpreted as binary? We value working software over comprehensive documentation and you get somebody that says, well, what do you mean? We don't document anything anymore? Well, no, of course not. It just means that we have to find the right balance. There's always a time to broadcast information at people, but if we want to do something meaningful, that's never going to work. Um, so we want to figure out how to balance these at the right time. We want to put the humanity back into change. We want people to stop Googling a recipe for cheesecake and following it to the letter. We want to provide a way for change agents to, to put the humanity and the thinking back into change by doing the, the right thing at the right particular time. And that's the magic. You know, we desperately want change to be science and it's linear and it should be standardized and it can never, ever work that way. Um, so if we find that right balance, we're more likely to do something more meaningful. The game, um, so again, I'll be in a room to try this out. We normally do this live. Each of those five uh, universals have a bunch of philosophies. And the language is important because methods and frameworks do not have values and principles as much as they publish that they do. We do as humans. So they obviously, yes, they're published to either sell you something or it reflects the values and principles of the person who created it. But those abstract things don't have values and principles. It has to come from us uh, as people. So these philosophies just help you go, hmm, you know what? If I looked at it that way, maybe I could try something different but it has to come from um, the, the change agent. So this game, obviously in person, it's if you can see the, uh, there's uh, the card game that we play. And the idea is we talk about the best things about change or the things we're most frustrated with. We play it like a card game. We come up with one and we design some experiments around it. And the whole premise is looking at change through a different set of lenses so we can help get things unstuck. So I'm gonna be playing this in one of the rooms. There's an online version of it that, that we'll try out if people are interested. And I'll be hanging out um, after that as well. If there are any other 
interesting thoughts or questions. So I know I did go through this quick. So um, thanks very much. <laughs>